In this video, I'd like to explain what is, in my opinion, the most beautiful modulation and one of the most complex and exceptional sonatas of all time, the connection between movements 1 and 2 of Liszt's sonata in B minor. In just three chords, Liszt moves between two distantly related keys and finishes the phrase coherently in 7. This is Polychoron Productions, and today, I'll be explaining the Liszt modulation. The modulation, which begins in bar 329, is preceded by a prolonged dominant 9th in the key of E minor, or a dominant 7 flat 9 in cool jazz talk. If you've taken any harmony or counterpoint based on the common practice period, much like Liszt would have, you'd expect this dominant chord, 5-9, to resolve to 1, which would sound somewhat like this. But no! Liszt sneakily travels to the diminished 7th chord of G-sharp minor. So, how did Liszt modulate a considerable distance around the circle of fifths in just one chord? Well, take another listen to the regular tonic resolution of the dominant ninth, and compare it to Liszt's resolution. Do you see it? If you ignore the note spellings and just look at the piano, two of the notes, E and G slash F double sharp, are present in both resolutions. Not only that, but the C slash B sharp is present in the dominant and least resolution, and the bottom F double sharp in least resolution is only a third away from the bottom note of the dominant. This near parsimonious voice leading, combined with the common tones between the expected and actual resolution, are what allows such disparate chords to resolve so smoothly. As mentioned, chord number two is a diminished seventh, so according to common practice voice leading rules, it should resolve to some tonic chord, which it does. The melody over this progression adds a bit of complexity. Instead of landing immediately on the chord tone of C-sharp, it lingers on the C-slash-B double sharp from the previous chord, before moving upwards to form the diminished chord. The non-chord tone of B-sharp over chord 2 could be considered a retardation. However, that information is only clear, at least to me, when analyzing the score on paper, which isn't how most people experience music. While listening to this piece, any distinction between enharmonic equivalents is lost, so I interpreted chord 2 as the dominant 7th of E-sharp, because I didn't know that this D-double-sharp was actually spelled as an E-natural. Interpreted this way, the C-sharp in the melody turns chord 2 into another spicy dominant 7 flat 9. Because the C-sharp is also present in chord 3 as a suspended 4th, it acts as a pivot note linking chords 2 and 3 together, a modulation strategy used by Liszt many times in this very sonata. No matter which interpretation that we take to get there, even if it's wrong, chord 3, G-sharp minor, is notable because it's the first chord that's enharmonic to the destination key of F sharp major. It's the chord based on the supertonic. As such, the progression becomes much more typical of the newly adopted chorale style. In the final key of F sharp major, chord 3 is 2, chord 4 is 1 6, and chord 5 is 7 of 4. Chord 5 contains the last predominant chord of the progression, with chord 6 being a dominant 7th with a 5 6 5 suspension. This resolves to 1 forming a perfect cadence and confirming the modulation to F-sharp major. Take a final listen to the modulation, this time hopefully understanding the masterful harmony and composition behind it. <laughs> 